Let's talk Messier objects. Yeah, Messier 86 and why I had to raid my fridge for this talk. Oh, wow. <laughs> Messier 86. <laughs> You'll be unsurprised to hear I don't even know what it is. <laughs> It's an elliptical galaxy. It lives in the Virgo cluster, so in this relatively nearby richish cluster of galaxies. It's actually one of the galaxies I think that Messier himself discovered sometime in the 1780s, so it's one of his sort of original discoveries. There are a couple of really big galaxies in the Virgo cluster and lots and lots of little ones, this one somewhere in between. You're selling it as pretty mediocre at this stage then. A medium-sized <laughs> galaxy and a famous old bunch of galaxies. So the interesting stuff comes when you start studying motions within the galaxy or the, even the motion of the galaxy itself. So remember the way we study motions is by you take a spectrum of the galaxy, so you split the light up into the colours of the rainbow, then you look for these little features associated with absorption by the various chemical elements, and then you use kind of the Doppler effect that tells you if those things are shifted a bit towards the red, that means the object's moving away from you, shifted towards the blue, then they're coming towards you. And the very unusual thing about Messier 86 is that it's actually blue shifted. It's coming towards us at about 240 kilometers per second. Why is that odd? Isn't there just a chance that its motion within the Virgo cluster on this particular day happens to be coming towards us and in a 100,000 years it'll sweep around and be moving away from us? That's actually the main part of the story. But remember, the other thing that's going on is the expansion of the universe. Part of the reason why we see redshifts in galaxies and why the vast majority of galaxies are redshifted is because the expansion of the universe is stretching the light out so the wavelengths get stretched to redder and redder wavelengths. Most galaxies are redshifted and as you go further and further away there's this thing called Hubble's law that says that if you go twice as far away they get twice as redshifted. So you would think for the Virgo cluster which is you know 45 million light years away that's far enough away that actually we should be seeing this redshift effect and in fact the redshift we would expect to see just from the expansion of the universe is about a thousand kilometers per second or thereabouts. So the fact that this thing is actually coming towards us means that th it's this combination of the two effects as the expansion of the universe is making it go away from us at a thousand kilometers per second or appear to go away from us at a thousand kilometers per second. But as you mentioned, there's also the motions within the cluster and they more than compensate for that. So this thing is piling towards us. It's basically coming almost straight at us at about 12, 1300 kilometers per second within the cluster. And then when you add those two together, the net effect is that the thing's still traveling towards us. So for something to be blue shifted when it's far away, it has to really be coming towards us. Absolutely. And in fact, we have some evidence that this thing really is moving at a fair speed, because if you look at the galaxy at X-ray wavelengths, you see the galaxy itself, but you see a streamer of material behind it. It's a very hot gas emitting in X-rays. And the reason for that is this thing's piling into the gas, which is there in the Virgo cluster, and the collision between the gas in the galaxy and the gas in the cluster is causing it to be stripped out as it travels through. What's the consequence of losing your gas? Presumably you get a lot less star formation? Yeah, I mean, this is already a, a, an early type galaxy, so an elliptical-ish galaxy. It probably didn't have that much star formation going on to start with. But certainly if a galaxy like the Milky Way fell into a cluster, it would almost certainly shut off the star formation because you lose the raw material for making more stars. So if you've lost your gas, do you become a bit of a boring dead galaxy? Not much of a party to go to? Yeah, you turn into one of these boring, smooth, passive galaxies that gets progressively redder as time goes on because you're not making any of those nice, exciting, new, bright blue stars that, that make galaxies kind of light up. And just so I'm clear, what's it losing its gas to? The gravitational pull of all the other objects? No, it's ram pressure, so it really is smacking into the, the gas that's there in the cluster, and the gas in this galaxy is just smacking into it and getting pushed out by it. So not only, of course, can you measure the speed of the whole galaxy by looking at these Doppler shifts in bits of the spectra, but actually you can look at different bits within the galaxy and you can see what, how the different parts of the galaxy are moving. M86 is a bit flattened. And so what you expect to see is probably it's flattened because the thing's rotating. And when something's rotating, what you expect to see is that one side of it's coming towards you and the other side of it's going away from you. You know, you've got to take out the motion of the whole galaxy as well, but after you've taken that out, you should see the rotation of the thing that would cause it to be flattened. And that's why, you know, galaxies like the Milky Way are flattened because they're these rotating disks. Okay, this thing's a bit flattened, so you'd expect to see a little bit of rotation and you'd expect it to be kind of around the minor axis or around the short axis of the thing. It's squashed that way, so you'd expect to see one bit coming towards you, the other bit going away from you. Yeah. That's not what you see at all. So let me show you what you actually see in M86. So M86, also known as NGC 4406. And here it is from a thing called the Sauron survey. The ellipses here show how the galaxy is flattened. Since it's flattened kind of about a short, short axis that way, we'd expect it to see it rotating that way. So, you know, maybe that side should be red shifted and that side should be blue shifted. That's not what you see at all. 
In the middle, you see a little tiny bit of rotation. This is one of these things called a kinematically decoupled core, where the middle's doing its own thing. I think Megan made a video that had a, a little bit about one of those in a little while ago. But basically, it's telling you that there's something weird going on right in the center. It's probably where something fell into it and has merged with it and is now just continuing to do its own thing. But at larger radii, rather than rotating around this axis, the short axis, you can actually probably see that there's blue at the top and red at the bottom. That means it's rotating around the long axis rather than the short axis. That's kind of a prolate object that's rotating around its long axis, which is very, very weird. Almost like a cigar or something rolling down a hill, sort yeah, of. Exactly, yeah, like, a, like rotating around a cigar. And that, that's very weird for lots of reasons, because, partly because, you know, it doesn't explain why the thing's flattened. If you expected the thing to be flattened by its rotation, it clearly isn't. Um, but actually, it's even weirder than that, because it turns out there is no way, if, if the thing is flattened, you know, if the thing's basically a, a sort of flattened disk, and you could say, oh, okay, so maybe it's a disk, and things are somehow rotating, you know, around the, the kind of the, the, the sort of weirdly around that disk, and you're seeing that kind of circulation around the top of the disk and around the bottom of the disk. But it turns out there are no orbit families that will do that. If you actually calculate how things orbit within a galaxy, you can have, if you've got an elliptical galaxy, you can have things on things called box orbits, which just basically means they go wherever they like. Or you can have things on things called tube orbits, which are kind of ones that avoid the middle of the galaxy and follow kind of more or less round and round in circles. The ones that go round and round in circles are the useful ones in terms of making something appear to rotate because, you know, obviously they're the ones that where something's rotating rather than just all moving in random directions. And if you look at these families of, of tube orbits, you find that they actually only exist around the minor axis. In other words, for something which is flattened uh, like a disk, the only way it can rotate is around that shortest axis. And so this thing can't be disk shaped. It has to be what's known as a triaxial ellipsoid. That's why I raided the fridge. OK, what do you got? <laughs> it's because I have a triaxial ellipsoid for you. This is a kiwi fruit. A kiwi fruit? And kiwi fruits are interesting because they are triaxial ellipsoids. They have no axis of symmetry. Right? You can say, I mean, the, you know, the obvious feature of a kiwi fruit is it has a long axis and a short axis. Right? It's kind of longer one way than it is the other. But if you look at it end on, it's still not round. It actually has one axis is shorter and the other axis is a little bit longer. So it has three principal axes, right? It has a long axis, an intermediate axis, kind of middle-sized one, and a short axis. The interesting thing is if you start trying to calculate orbits in triaxial ellipsoids, you find that there are two different families of these tube orbits, these ones that go round and round. There's the ones that go around the shortest axis, so they're really like the ones in a disk galaxy, but there are also a family that go around the longest axis as well. You could actually, if you made a, a, a kiwi fruit out of stars, it could actually end up orbiting around its longest axis. So what we saw uh, in M86 is, is characteristic of what you would expect if the intrinsic shape of the galaxy was something like a kiwi fruit. Professor, what made this galaxy kiwi fruit shaped in the first place? It's not clear. I mean, because of that kinematically decoupled core in the middle, we know this thing's had a pretty disturbed history. So things have smashed into it. It's been kicked around. It's now falling into a cluster. It's probably encountered other galaxies along the way. So it wouldn't be so surprising if its shape were really quite disturbed. And so it's just settled down into a shape that's not axisymmetric. It's no longer a dish shape or a, a cigar shape. It's somewhere in between that has three different axes of symmetry. It's kiwi fruit shaped. It is kiwi fruit shaped. If only that galaxy could talk, what a story it would tell. <laughs> Last thing to be tested, because you don't want to go all the way to Pluto and not take an image. So what they did was, uh, first thing obviously was open sort of the lens cap, if you will. It was kind of like a hinge door that was covering Laurie. And then five minutes later, they finally got an image. <laughs> 